The Europa League winner that Arsenal must sign this summer. Find out who it is on this edition of the Chronicles of Aguna podcast. To the left-hand side for Vieira. He'll play it through to Gabriel Jesus, who's in here for Arsenal. Gabriel Jesus to finish it off. Oh, what a way to do it! Gabriel Jesus seals the points for Arsenal. He's back, and he's back with a bang! Into the penalty area it goes. Gabriel Keller, and it's into the back of the net. Arsenal take an early lead through Gabriel. You're listening to the Chronicles of Aguna. The Daily Arsenal Podcast with me, Harry Simeon. Hey everybody, how's it going? Hope you're all good. Hope you're all well. Welcome back to another episode of the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal Podcast with me, your host, Harry Simeon. On today's episode, we're going to discuss the Europa League winner that Arsenal must sign this summer. He is the answer to a big problem that we have in the team. We're also going to talk a little bit about Granit Xhaka after his Bayer Leverkusen side lost their invincible record, were beaten in the Europa League final by Atalanta. I want to talk a little bit about his performance because I felt really sorry for him last night. We're also going to talk about Yusuf Fofana, a player that has continuously been linked with Arsenal in the past. There's a bit of an update on what his future might look like and uh, whatever else comes to mind during the next 20, 25 minutes or so. It is a pre-recorded edition today. Apologies for that. Um, But in order to uphold the consistency levels, this is going to happen from time to time. Uh, If you are listening to this uh, on playback or uh, listening back to the audio from one of your podcast apps, you won't care anyway. It won't make the slightest bit of difference to you, but I know we have a really engaged audience that do tune into the lives. So apologies to them that I'm not able to do that today. Let's start off by talking Granite Xhaka because, look, I was as upset as anybody when he left the football club. But you guys know, those of you that have listened to this for a while will know that I was always quite a staunch defender of Granit Xhaka because I always felt that he got a rough ride at Arsenal Football Club. And a lot of the time, it just wasn't justified. Yeah, there were some bad performances along the way. There were some moments of madness that led to unnecessary red cards and and things like that, that you could argue did put us in a really difficult position and ultimately contribute to us not achieving our goals. All of that is valid. The way he reacted um, when, of course, he was booed off against Crystal Palace, that rubbed a lot of Arsenal fans up the wrong way. Me, personally, I didn't like it at the time, but... I remember being more taken aback by the toxicity in the air than Granit Xhaka's individual actions. And I remember that being a kind of trigger point for me as if to kind of show me that actually the culture is broken here. You know, the the, the connection between fans and players is, is completely and utterly gone and something needs to be done about that. Obviously, Mikel Arteta came in, helped mend that, helped fix that. And Granit Xhaka's redemption story was a big part of what Mikel Arteta did really, really well um, in the sort of early years of his Arsenal tenure. And then last season felt like his best season in an Arsenal shirt and people started to finally appreciate what it is that he brings to the table, what it is that he contributes. And come the summer, he wanted to go. He wanted to go to Germany. He wanted to join Bayer Leverkusen and Xabi Alonso's project. And you can't say that that's been a bad decision on Granit Xhaka's part. He's gone there. He's become a key part of a very successful team, a side that have gone the entire Bundesliga season unbeaten, that made the Europa League final, albeit they were beaten quite comfortably in that, but also have a German Cup final to play at the weekend. So he could still end up a double winner, um, Granit Xhaka. And if he doesn't, well, he's got a whole league season unbeaten and lifted the Bundesliga title for the first time in Bayer Leverkusen's history. So he's a history maker at Leverkusen, whatever way you look at it. But I remember feeling down in the dumps, particularly at the start of this season, when we couldn't quite find the right balance in midfield and thinking, why did we let this guy go? Like I know he wanted to go and I know that he wanted to go previously. And we did a good job of kind of convincing him that, no, you do have a future here. But it's one of those things where you might be sort of sweeping um, you know, the, the, the issue into the corner, but it, it will, it, it will be noticed again. It will 
resurface at some point and it will need to be dealt with further down the line. Unfortunately, we just got to that point with Granit Xhaka where there was nothing else we could do. With regards to the Europa League final as an individual game, I didn't think Granit Xhaka played that well. And that made me feel a little bit sad because he's been such a big part of that team. And then for him to turn up in the Europa League final and just not deliver is obviously something that he personally will be really disappointed with. What I will say is that the entire team failed to deliver. They were outthought. They were outplayed. Um, and and I think although Jabi Alonso is a really, really good, young, promising coach, and I know that the Liverpool fans were desperate to see him appointed once it was announced and revealed that Jurgen Klopp would be going, I think Jean Piero Gasparini showed him up a little bit last night. The the value of experience, the value of having been there and done it, not even at that level. Jean Piero Gasparini hadn't won a trophy um, up until that point. It was the first major trophy in his career, 66-year-old coach. But nobody can deny that he's done a, a, a superb job at Atalanta to even get them in this position. And I always said, and I said it on yesterday's episode, that for me, I was desperate to see Gasparini get his kind of crowning moment. And that's exactly what he got. And he got that because he completely outthought Xabi Alonso. He figured out a way to stifle their free-flowing style of play. It was quite a bold way to do it as well because he didn't just sit back and try and soak up pressure. He played with a back three and he pushed players right up onto those Leverkusen defenders even. The press was so high, it was so aggressive and it was super, super effective. I digress a little bit. Let's get back to the kind of Granite Xhaka chat. But I just think for him, it, it just wasn't his night last night. You know those nights where you try a pass that you would pull off nine out of ten times and you've tried it ten times and you know what? You've only pulled it off twice on the night. And he wasn't the only one that was way below the level that we've seen from Bayer Leverkusen this season. But I was particularly saddened watching him struggle. Um, congratulations to Atalanta. It's a wonderful, wonderful story. They're not a big football club at all. Bergamo uh, stands in the shadows of Milan. And so to go on and win a European trophy like that is, is just massive. It, it really, really is. So congratulations to them. Commiserations to Bayer Leverkusen, who have still had a fantastic season. But I just wanted to chat about Granit Xhaka because what I don't want is people of an Arsenal persuasion. And I've seen a bit of this online um, since the final ended. I, what I don't want is people going, Granit Xhaka, back to being Granit Xhaka. You know, that that wasn't the case. You know, Bayer Leverkusen were just out thought, were outplayed by a very, very good Atalanta side. And it's as simple as that. Granit Xhaka was one of a group of players that I think will look back on that game with regret rather than being the main uh, sort of protagonist in their failure, if you like. Okay. Um, we're going to talk about another midfielder, a midfielder that's been linked with Arsenal in the past, a midfielder that a lot of you have told me over the last six months or so, Arsenal should be looking to move for this summer. Well, could it be a possibility? We'll get into that right after this really, really short pause. Monaco's Yusuf Fofana is a player that I've heard lots of Arsenal fans over the last six months suggesting could be the answer for us in midfield. I've talked a lot in recent episodes about the need to kind of regenerate that area of the pitch. The fact that, yep, we've given Jorginho this contract extension, but it's only a short-term thing. And given the stage Jorginho is at in his career, you're not looking at him as the long-term solution. Um, but, you know, the the Partey thing, that, that's pretty much up in the air. I, I, I still like what he brings and I still like what he gives you on the ball and in possession. But in the last few games, I've seen a significant drop off in his physical levels, which then impacts how dominant he can be, which then impacts how much you can let Declan Rice loose, which then impacts the, the whole balance of the team. And I'm starting to wonder if it's time to cut our losses on Thomas Partey. And if you'd have asked me this three weeks ago, my opinion would have been the complete opposite. But Yusuf Fafana is someone I've I've consistently heard Arsenal fans talking about us going out and signing. Now, he, of course, currently plays his football at Monaco. And according to Fabrizio Romano on the Court Offside podcast, Monaco have hinted 
that Yusuf Fofana could be a name to leave the club this summer. He says his understanding is that Monaco will communicate the asking price for Fofana in one or two weeks. He says, I think he could be available for 20 million euros. Given the potential that people tell me this guy has, um, and and I'll I'll be the first to admit I haven't seen a lot of him. And this is another player to go on the list with Benjamin Sesco of players that we're going to do breakdowns of over the coming weeks as the kind of transfer window starts to um, starts to well opens first and then starts to pick up. Um, I don't know a lot about him, but the way people speak about him for twenty million euros sounds like it might be worth a little bit of a gamble. I would argue that you might even get half of that money in for Sambi Lokonga, who um, told the BBC yesterday, by the way, that um, he's spoken to Arsenal and that the, the best thing for all parties is that he departs. Still has a year left on his contract and an additional year's option, um, but Arsenal have told him to look for a new club. So, you know, if you sold Sambi Lokonga for 10 million quid, you probably wouldn't get that right now. And I know people are going to be screaming at their phones or laptops or whatever they are listening to me from and saying, here he goes again, undervaluing our players. No, I'm just being realistic. And you will see, because this has happened before, this has happened in the last two or three summers where I've gone into the window and said, you'll be lucky to get X amount for this player. And I've had people come at me and say, what's the matter with you? Why are you undervaluing our players? Somebody is only worth what somebody else is willing to pay. And I think with Lukonga who Arsenal signed with really high hopes, didn't quite cut it, went off to Luton Town, had a decent season with them, but obviously they were relegated. I think to demand anything more than like 10, 15 million at the, or 15 at the top end, I think is is a little bit unrealistic. But if you got 10 in and that funded half of a deal for Yusuf Fafana, who so many tell me has all the raw attributes to go on and become a really, really good player, then maybe that's something worth doing and maybe that's something worth considering. But yeah, just wanted to bring you up to speed on that. Yusuf Fofana um, is apparently going to be available for around about 20 million euros. Let me know in the comments if he's someone you'd be interested in. Okay, what else have we got? Arsenal have been ranked number one as the most sustainable club across 59 leagues in the world. And that is based on the stability of the squad, the age structure and the contract policy. This is a, a, something that's been carried out by the CIES uh, survey or whatever it's called. Um, I'm told it's a trusted source. <laughs> um, but yeah, I was talking a lot yesterday about the state of the club, about the financial state, about the fact that we've tied down uh, key players to lengthy contracts, that we've protected ourselves, that we've managed to get our wage bill to a position where it's under control, but we're also competitive in what we can pay in terms of player salaries. And I think this coming out at the time that it did yesterday, shortly after I recorded the pod is when I came across it, um, it is apt. And I thought that it was worth bringing that up and highlighting that because, yeah, it just it just shows you, doesn't it, that the club's gone from being really badly run to actually being really, really well run. And, you know, we talked about revenues yesterday and obviously revenues help um, and allow you to uh, be more competitive in, in the transfer market and attract the players ultimately that you want to fend off competition from others. But you still need you still need the money to be able to go out and do that if you want to compete at the very, very top level and you want to make it sustainable, which we are, according to this Arsenal, the most sustainable uh, club across 59 leagues in the world based on, as I say, the stability of the squad, our age structure, which we work really hard to get right, I think, where we've got players that are like 23, 24 years old, but also very experienced 23, 24 year olds and our contract policy where we've been really, really proactive, which is not something you could always say of Arsenal in the past. OK, after this very short pause, we're going to talk about the player who won the Europa League last night, the Arsenal, in my opinion, need to try and sign this summer. Atalanta were crowned Europa League winners last night. And obviously the standout performer was Adamola Lukman because he scored a hat-trick. It will be known as the Adamola Lukman final. And when you think about the journey he had uh, a little bit earlier on in his career and some of the rejections he had in the Premier League, to see him do that was incredible. The first goal was brilliant um, 
in terms of reading of what was developing and getting across the defender nice and quickly and making sure he finished. The second goal, nutmegging Granite Xhaka and finding the bottom corner the way he did was outstanding. And the third goal for me was the best of the bunch. The step over, the shifting of the ball onto the left foot and the rifling of it into the top corner. It was mwah, brilliant to see. And I'm really pleased for Adam Ola Lukman because whenever I've seen interviews um, that he's done or heard him speak, he always comes across as a really humble, nice guy. And he's obviously had his fair share of rejection. He's found a home at Atalanta. He said that Gasparini is the strictest coach that he's ever had, but clearly... Gasparini is getting a lot out of him and he had his crowning moment, as did Gasparini last night with that Europa League victory. But he's not the guy that we're talking about here. The guy we're talking about is Atalanta's Brazilian midfielder who goes by the name of Edison. Now, this is a guy who's 24 years old, um, hasn't actually had a cap for Brazil yet, officially born in Campo Grande, a central midfielder who does his best work, I would say, in that slightly deep lying position. Now, he has a contract at Atalanta until 2027. So it's not a deal that we're going to be able to do completely on the cheap. But given Atalanta's financial situation, of course, that would have been boosted by their Europa League victory. You know, they're not a club in a space where if you go and offer 50, 60 million pounds for one of their players, they'd be able to turn it down easily. Um, now, he joined Atalanta from Salernitana back in July 2022. And Atalanta paid 22.9 million euros for him, which is a lot of money by Atalanta's standards. He arrived in Italy to Salernitana um, in the January uh, before he arrived from Corinthians. And it took, what, six months for people to cotton on to what a talented player he looked. And Atalanta in that summer went on to sign him. And um, what a bit of business that has been. Now, I was looking into um, some of uh, Fafana's stats um, a little bit earlier on this morning. Um, let me bring some of those up and I can share with you guys why I think he is a good option for us. Well, look, first of all, the, the top line stuff, very physical, gets about the pitch really, really well. Clearly has a great understanding of the game, always on hand to intercept things, great anticipation but also looks to me like someone who on a technical level could fit in. You know, he's got the ability to play progressive passes, which is something I think is key when we're talking about a potential parte replacement. He's got the ability um, to take people on, to carry the ball. All of these things uh, make him stand out for me. If I take you over uh, to this page on FB Ref, the stats website, um, let me show you now. Um, why I think, you know, this guy would be a really, really good fit. Let me try and make that a bit bigger for you guys to see, actually. There you go. So um, if you look at this, you're talking about someone who, when it comes to non-penalty goals, is in the 87th percentile. Now, for a midfielder, you know, when we talk about a lot of midfielders that get forward and that contribute goals, and he's being compared to midfielders here, of course, but this is compared to players in the top five leagues over the last... 365 days based on the number of minutes played. You're talking about someone who does most of his work in a deeper position, being in the 87th percentile for non-penalty goals. If you look at his statistics this season, uh, he's got six uh, league goals for Atalanta, one assist as well, um, and he's got one goal in the Europa League. It's not a massive amount, but if you're talking about a defensive midfielder turning out those sort of numbers, I think that's really, really strong. You then look at other things like progressive passes, where he's in the 80th percentile, um, averaging 6.38 per game, which again highlights his suitability, I think, to potentially replacing someone like Thomas Partey. Interceptions, um, 85th percentile, tackles, 72nd. And you might look at that and think, well, it doesn't make as many tackles as some of his peers. Well, that's because he's so good and proactive when it comes to intercepting the ball. So, you know, this is a player for me that when I looked into the underlying stats like this earlier today, I was really, really taken aback by. He looked great yesterday, but it's really easy, isn't it, to look at a player in a one-off game and say, oh, wow, he looks a player. He looks like someone we could move for and, and someone who could add something to the squad. I followed Edison, I'm not going to say with a microscope over the last season or so, but obviously I'm, I'm quite across Italian football and he's been 
on my radar from the Salernitana days. We know that he's been linked to the likes of Newcastle, to the likes of Tottenham Hotspur. Um, and, and I understand why, you know, people would make a comparison between him and Bruno Guimaraes, for example, because I think stylistically they're quite similar in that they can get forward, they can get involved in your attacking and creative play, but they can also do the slightly uglier stuff in the defensive positions and in the defensive phases. So for me, he is someone that would be, you know, available to us as a six, but also available to us as an eight as well, if you wanted that. And I think we have seen at points this season when Mikel Arteta has been a bit worried about the balance in midfield where he's gone Jorginho Rice. And in an ideal world, you want Jorginho to be the base because you'd rather have Rice getting into those attacking positions. But you also worry and you're slightly concerned by Jorginho's lack of physicality. So you, you've you seen Arteta try and play them as a, a double pivot, as kind of a, a two and make the midfield into a bit more of a four in certain phases to help us to manage that balance. Well, I don't think you'd have that worry with Edison. I don't think Edison is the kind of player that you'd look at and go, I'm a bit worried about leaving him at the base in midfield because physically he's not quite there in the same way that you'd look at Jorginho, for example. Partey is going to move on, whether it's this season or uh, wet this summer, I beg your pardon, or next summer, he is going to go at some point. And I think succession planning in that midfield for Arsenal is really, really important. I think there's a ceiling with regards to what I'd pay for Edison. I don't think I'd go more than 50 million, but I think, you know, for 50 million, I think there's a good chance that you prize him away from Atalanta. He will want to come and play in the Premier League at some point in his career, I am sure. The uh, attraction of joining a club like Arsenal and a club that's got quite a strong Brazilian contingent as well, which will make him feel at home. I know people say that doesn't matter. It does, man. You know, if he arrives and he's got Gabriel and he's got Martinelli and he's got Jesus and he's got Portuguese speakers like Fabio Vieira there as well, you know, that could help him manage the transition from Serie A um, to the Premier League. I know I've gassed myself up loads about this player and I'm hoping that I've done the same to you guys, but I, I looked at him last night and it wasn't the moment where I realised he's a good player. It wasn't the, the kind of point where I went, oh, I'm going to take a bit more notice of this lad now. It was more of a confirmation. It was more of a confirmation of the fact that he's done well at Atalanta over a period of time is now what we need. You know, he's now someone that we could really benefit from going forward. So, yeah, as I say, it wasn't the light bulb moment, but it was the confirmation of the fact that there is really a player in there. Let me know your thoughts. Edison, is he the answer to Arsenal's midfield regeneration that we're anticipating coming in the not too distant future. Thank you for tuning in. As always, make sure you leave a like, subscribe, all the rest of it. If you're listening on the audio platform, please do leave us a review as well. It really, really does help. And I will see you all on the next one. Until then, take care. All the best.